Hi everyone, thanks for joining us again uh, this week. We've got a great panel and uh, we really appreciate you taking your time to joining us when we know that there's so many uh, webinars out there and so many uh, different talks that you can go to. So we do appreciate it. We have a great panel uh, this week, um, very focused to the catering community. Um, most of you know a lot of the people here, but I'm gonna still ask them to introduce yourself. Don't forget to write questions. Meredith's going to read them out. Uh, we are going to get to a lot of questions this session. And um, all questions are welcome. And you can address it to anyone in particular, or you can just leave it blank and anybody will answer. So please uh, feel free to um, ask your questions. So today we're, um, we've got Carl Sachs. Uh, hi, Carl. Hi. How are you? Um, Carl's going to tell everyone a little bit about himself, but I'm sure a lot of people, again, know him. So, Carl, give us a little background. Uh, I'm here as the executive director of Leading Caterers of America. I've got almost 40 years in the catering business, and I've never seen anything quite like this before. So, I'm here to talk about how yeah. different this is. Yeah. Then we've got Norm, uh, uh, Norm Bennett. Can you tell us, hi, hi, Norm. Thanks for joining us. You want to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, Norm Bennett. I'm the founder of uh, 24 Carats LLC and um, chef by trade. And we're looking forward to cooking some food here again soon. <laughs> and everyone knows Meryl up there. Meryl, say hi. Hi. Oh, do I have to say anything else? You want it? Well, you want it? You want it? It just say. I mean, everybody knows Meryl. I can't imagine that Meryl has to actually introduce herself. But why not, Meryl? Why not? Why not? Okay, Meryl Snow with Festivities Event and a leading caterer of America and a consultant. And I'm from Philadelphia. And uh, I have not seen anything like this. I mean, we've been through 9/11, the 2008 yeah, recession or crash, but nothing like this. So very difficult. And we've got Reed Phillips. Uh, Reed, we're really happy to have you join us. Um, if you could just say where you're from. And yeah, thanks for including me. I have um, two event venues in Livermore, California, which is basically San Francisco Bay Area, directly to the east. And we do strictly um, on-site catering. So we are not doing any offsite any longer once we built our two venues. But happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to, um, we might Andrea have one more person on. join us. Andrea. Oh, is Andrea, on. are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hey, Andrea. Oh, I'm so happy we can hear you. So that's great news. So Andrea's with us. Andrea, just give us a quick intro. Uh, tell us a little bit where you're from and what you're, what you're doing right now, apart from. Um, my name is Andrea Coriali. I own a catering company called Elegant Affairs. It's all off-premise catering. I cater from uh, the Hamptons to Manhattan and the surrounding areas. Our parties have um, basically ceased, um, but uh, we started an online grocery store, and we're doing um, dinner um, deliveries and now parties in a box. Okay, so that's great. Andrea, I'm going to stay with you because uh, you're answering my first question and I'd like to go into it in a little bit more detail. So the first question is, uh, we're talking about creative ideas. Um, we're talking about how you've pivoted for the moment, uh, what you're doing. You obviously decided to keep your doors open to some extent. Um, can you give our audience a little bit of background, you know, why you went in that direction, how it benefited you, what, what it's doing for your community? and anything that you want to share with us? So basically, you know, I knew that the bottom was falling out and um, I guess I'm this the type of person not to panic. I just start going into like fight or flight mode and I'm thinking about, okay, how can we keep money coming in through the doors? The first thing that came to me was that I couldn't get a grocery delivery in the New York area. It was very hard. Um, so I called on my food purveyors, found out what, um, packs they make that would be um, user-friendly for the average homeowner, um, found different suppliers, went on, uh, built a website over a weekend, um, started um, 
blasting it using um, our e-blast list, social media, Instagram. I put a commercial up on the local news channel. Um, and um, and we've been, uh, we've been moving. I mean, um, it's been, uh, and now we just launched a barbecue in a box, Mother's Day in a box. I'm going to be doing parties in a box. You know, inexpensive items would drop off with, with no staff. And, um, you know, so far it's been going pretty well. In the last month, we did about, I don't know, 190000 in sales, which was much more than I ever anticipated. Um, is that with the grocery nothing. store? Is that with the grocery store or the, the meals in a box or both? Both. Combined. Both. That's mm -hmm. substantial. God, no shit. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's substantial, but I haven't done my P&L yet. So the thing is, is that I don't know. I, I, I'm assuming that the margins are small. The only reason why we're making money is because of the PPP because the labor is basically for free. So if I put all the labor in, at least I'm going to break even for the month. You know what I mean? I'm not going to, I won't be losing money, which is, which is important. But the thing is, is that I don't know if in two or three weeks that this is just going to fall. You know, I, mean, I have no clue. It depends, you know, when things open up. Very cool. Well, listen, I think that's a, uh, you, you know, you definitely put on a creative hat there. Um, you want to share, uh, anybody, Reed, do you want to, do you want to give us a little bit of idea? Did you guys, obviously your events were cancelled. Um, you're only catering to your properties, right? So you put every, you, you closed down for the moment or are most of your events been postponed? We, I mean, we're basically closed down for, the time being because our two commercial kitchens are actually in each of our venues. So we do all of our food prep there and all of the execution of the food there. So, I mean, we basically, instead of diverting, diverging from our mission and our, the, uh, our business plan that we have maintained for the last 15 years, since we built these two venues, um, it doesn't make sense for us to open up and do delivery. I'm not in an urban area. I'm pretty, you know, I mean, yes, there are lots of people in the Tri-Valley, but there would not be enough work for us to make it profitable um, or even break even. Also, when you've got commercial kitchens that are only doing like higher middle class weddings, my executive chefs make too much money for me to be able to do a drop off or a pickup business and afford to have them on my payroll. We would need to have um, hourly people at minimum wage and then who is going to manage them. So I've just, I think I, my success comes from the fact that I know what we do well and that's what we're concentrating on. So our efforts are with, there are 11 of us are working, eight of, three of us are principals, and then um, we have eight people that are doing all of the marketing and dealing with all of the postponements. And we've already moved 65 weddings through the second week of June, and we're starting to go through June, and we'll start July when we feel like that's gonna be necessary. Um, and we're doing really creative things with how we're dealing with people. So that's how we've been spending our time is learning how other caterers and, and venues are effectively um, moving people by keeping people happy with the product that we provide and convinced that they don't want to go anywhere else. Our clients are convinced that they came to us because of our reputation and because they care about the the attention that they've gotten from my staff from the first time they've walked in the venue and um, they want their wedding and they want it with us. So, I mean, I'm happy Wonderful. for that. It's just so, yeah, so basically you're, you're not really losing any business. You don't have it immediate, but it's been postponed. So you've got that opportunity. Are you, are you looking into, are you even thinking about the social distance? Sing as how you're preparing for the July weddings or you're not even going in that direction yet? Oh, we're thinking about everything. I mean, 
Meryl's question to you earlier before the recording started was like, do we really have to be positive the whole time during this webinar? But the reality <laughs> is uh, I'm positive because my venues are large. I mean, my main ballrooms are each 10,000 square right. feet. So if we follow what Georgia, for example, quoted that in every 500 square feet, you could have 10 people. I'm up to 200, dude. I am happy as hell with those numbers. So if that happens, <laughs> locally, uh, that would be a really wonderful thing. So yeah, we're right. I wish I had all seated because I would definitely be using your models. That'll be when we have more we'll money. We'll talk afterwards. <laughs> No worries. We'll do. We'll do something for you, Reed. Don't worry. So, Carl, let, let's uh, let's talk a little bit general. And Meryl, maybe you want to come into this a little bit as well. And, and Norm, I'm going to come to you because we definitely want to come to the chef's creative ideas and, and thinking how you're maneuvering in that way. But maybe uh, Carl and Meryl, we can discuss here a little bit. You know, what are you hearing? Because you hear things on a wider angle, right? You're Carl. You're involved with a lot of caterers. Meryl, you've got your own catering company, but you're also involved doing your consultancy. Do you want to share some of those? Uh... I'll start. Okay. Um, we are, no our company itself, <clears throat> we're in an induced coma right now. We're very much like Reed, where we, we don't have the business model of, of delivery and takeout and things like that. And for us to do that, to jump over to that, and reinvent the wheel that we don't have any idea how to do. We are very good at large corporate events, um, social events, galas, weddings, and that is not in our wheelhouse. And we thought, okay, we'll just step back, get into this induced coma and start working on other aspects of the business. Um, we still have our salespeople working and they're still booking. They're, we're dealing with many, uh, well, the corporate is all gone. I mean, that's just went away. Um, but as for the weddings, we have been able to postpone them. I think we only lost one out of all those weddings. And that's we're great. working now on plan B or actually plan C. And we're, we're letting clients pick another date in the future. Our 2021 is very well stocked. So if we're taking this pause right now, and basically in our mind, we are kind of letting 2020 be itself and really concentrating on 2021 and stacking that. So right now with this induced pause, we're really, we're, we're not making any money, but we're not losing a lot of money either. And uh, that's where we are. As for my clients, uh, I do want to say that it's okay to not do these things that you see everybody's doing. That a lot of clients feel, or a lot of caterers feel like, I should be doing takeout, I should be doing the box, I should be doing Mother's Day. And I'm like, you don't have to, because they feel like they have to because they need to survive. Just like but many other catering companies decide, all right, let's just hold back. Let's work internally of what we can do for the future. And, you know, figure out your policies and procedures and how you're going to navigate through this. So that's what I'm seeing. Carl? I think that there are, there is business out there right now. It's mostly being funded by either various levels of government or by charitable institutions. Um, I heard yesterday that there's a caterer in New York doing 25,000 meals a day, not getting much money for them, but that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of uh, production to do, um, and then hearing from other caterers around the country in smaller markets, the type of governmental opportunities can be anywhere from a few hundred meals a day to a few thousand meals a day. But again, it's all very low margin business. But if you're trying to keep some of your people occupied, it's definitely an approach to take. Um, my guess is that the wedding business which is the single largest component of the catering industry, it's probably going to come back sooner rather than later, you know, assuming that we start to see some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of you know, the possibility of having a vaccine or real treatments, um, then maybe by later on this year, some of that business will really start to return. Um, some people are definitely in better positions than others. Reed controls both of her venues and they're very large so that she can handle a you know, a medium-sized wedding without people being right on top of each other. 
But uh, the large scale corporate events, I think it's going to be a while before that business comes back. And what's unfortunate about that is probably a lot of the real profit is in the large scale business. And um, I think there's going to be some real reticence of corporations to doing anything at any point this year, unless there's a miracle cure that comes out that we're not seeing yet. So that's what I'm hearing from people around the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I tend to agree with you. I, I, we're hearing the same. Now, Norm, you're coming from the chef side, and I'm sure you're just dying to get your uh, hands into those big catering uh, bowls. And so are you looking to prepare things differently now? What, what are your thoughts on maybe this can lead in a little bit into the next uh, question of, you know, how do you think, are you going to do anything different for the future? Now, obviously, nobody has the answer of what the future is going to look like. And, you know, at one stage of the future, things are going to go back to normal. Like Carl said, we are going to get a vaccine. We are all going to get back on planes. But, you know, it could be six months, it could be nine months, it could be a year. Nobody really knows. So are you, what, what is 24 Carats uh, thinking about? Can you give us some insight to that? You know what? We, it's, it's a topic of a discussion every day. And, you know, you're going to have clients, I think, that are going to want to see you wearing masks and gloves. And other clients are going to go, ooh, no, no. I mean, it's really going to be really connecting with your client and asking them what they want. And even at the event, you know, you can, you can have all the square footage you want. But if they're all on the dance floor dancing with each other, I mean, you know, we're, we're searching even from legalities. Do we need a special, you know, form that everybody has to sign so we're not liable if somebody gets sick because they went to a party. Sure. And, uh, but, you know, much like Andrea, we, we've done the same thing. We decided to stay open. We had a, a delivery aspect of our business that um, we were doing every day. And we added a grocery store as well called Provisions, 24 Care Provisions. Like her, we have family meals. That's our party in a box. We're doing Mother's Day. We're doing Cinco de Mayo. Um, we've also reached out to like the Anaheim Ducks and had them feed frontliners. So we're still pretty active. Actually, that that corporate business right now, we're doing a little less than Andrea per month, but uh, it's only five percent of my revenue, and we're really wanting to see weddings come back. That, that was really our bread and butter. And even larger corporate events, I, I, I think we were pretty much 80%, 85% weddings. And I guess my hope is that the sooner things get back to normal, <laughs> easier <laughs> for us. I mean, we're in a catering world. Everything, there's so many moving parts. Our world is hard enough as it is. And now we got to add what else to the mix here? <laughs> Tie another arm behind our back. It's uh, absolutely interesting. It'll be interesting, but I'm I'm welcoming the interesting. We can just get going again. Yeah, <laughs> I'm ready to go. I know uh, some of our brides are really getting creative. One of them said, "How about if we put thermometers at the entrance and everybody has to take a temperature before they come in?" You know. Um, it, it, but yeah, I, I mean, I if you, Meryl, remember, remember when we went, when we started to travel, we never went through X-ray machines to to, to, to look at our body right. temperatures. Right. You know, exactly. we didn't do that ten years ago. So maybe that's how it's going to be. You're going to go into a large event. Everybody's going to have their temperature taken. At least we know for those few hours, everybody's well, right? Who knows tomorrow? Right. But... <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the challenges what else, what else there are, are people that are that are asymptomatic and then may not have a temperature, but still may be carriers. So that's mm -hmm. one of the challenges there. Mm -hmm. But I do think we probably aren't gonna be taking temperatures at events. I think the other thing that's really important is making sure you have specific and exact list of everybody that's coming to your events for contact, excuse me, contact tracing purposes. And I think that's maybe something that could be part of the all, season, all seated model that you have people so that we know exactly who is that's there so if someone does turn out to be a carrier that we can track on everybody that they may have interacted with. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. Yeah. 
What else are you hearing, Meryl? What other, uh, Andrea, you want to offer anything else on that note? Otherwise, we'll, we'll head into the um, second question quickly, and then we want to open it up to our audience. No, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, that, that I think everyone just has to be careful if they get PPT money, that it has to go, you know, towards payroll. So if you really look at it, it's eight weeks of free payroll unless you don't use it. You know what I mean? So if you don't have any business going on, then I just think it makes sense to do something at least to, you know, keep your company together and to make, you know, and, and, and to be able to take advantage of that um, of that government plan. That's well, we had an LCA uh, call a very good where we had a number of the owners, basically their consensus was even if it doesn't, even if they don't change the term so that it's partially forgivable, what this is is it's a low interest loan that does not require personal and because of that, definitely advantageous if you can get PPP money, even if you're not employing people right now, it's definitely something you should do. Yeah, everybody should be applying for that, definitely. I mean, even it's it's for every business. It's not just for the caterers. It's for any business. Uh, we yeah. applied for it as well. Everybody should be applying for it. Mm -hmm. So um, we touched on this a little bit. Uh, Norm helped us a little bit and, you know, talk about, the future and obviously he just wants everything to go back to normal like all of us want everything to go back to normal <laughs> and Reed, you're you're obviously thinking about you know you're lucky because you're in a situation where you've got a big space um on the catering side are you guys putting in um like sanitation are, are you going to be leading the way that, that uh customers or clients are going to be asking now to see documentation or understand how are you preparing the food and are you look are you seeing that you're going to have to maybe pre to prepare it in uh, or, or lay it out or send it out in a different way maybe reed you want to start a little bit with that well i mean obviously everybody in the industry is going to be working on sops around this issue and it's kind of like everything that we have been talking about for the last six weeks, every day something changes. But what I have realized is that there are organizations, and I know that the LCA is going to come up with some guidelines that will be super helpful for us. So restaurant right. associations, um, the big players, like I got an incredible document from Wynn Casinos and Resorts in Vegas and all of their SOPs are like brilliantly spelled out. So for, for those of us who are not huge companies, we will have assistance in putting this stuff together because all the big dogs are doing it. And all we need to do is find out what is going to be most applicable for us. Like I could take um, SOPs from the Marriott and, you know, rewrite them to be appropriate for us, but we're, other than the rooms, I mean, our banquet space is not just unsimilar to what they're doing. So just a little bit, I'm trying to be, uh, advise people that there are going to be super smart people who are coming up with a lot of this and we all should be prepared to be able to borrow the word, the verbiage from them and come up with a really effective plan. That's the way I'm dealing with it. Smart. Stealing from others, <laughs> basically. Yeah. I think that's a very smart, smart way yeah. to do it. I think I think Mary, you want to add something? Yeah, I do. Um, we have to think about how our customers are going to be viewing us. And I think that before with the, a, a cater, it, they were always so proud of made from scratch. And that was something we always pushed, but now we have to pivot to how are we going to keep their their guests safe? And I think along those lines with the Marriott and all those big ones, I mean, we can adapt that. And that is going to be a huge selling tool. That's part of the selling script now and being very, very transparent yeah. about how we're going to keep their guests safe. It's important. Uh, with the LCA, we're, we're putting together a working group of uh, senior level managers and chefs from 
a number of our members to, to work on this exact topic. We're trying to deal with not only front of house, back of house, but also how we manage our warehouses, how we deal with deliveries, receiving, shipping, et cetera, et cetera. And there's almost certainly some really clever ideas out there that no one has thought of yet. And we're hoping that we get them first. Now, we're not necessarily, even if we come up with something really clever, we're not necessarily gonna retain it just among ourselves, among the LCA, but we hope to be able to be the leaders in this, uh, not necessarily the followers. And we're, essentially what we're doing is we're crowdsourcing these ideas yeah. among our member companies. Yeah. Cool. Andrea, what, what's going on at your, your side? Are you, um, how are you preparing uh, for, you know, when the events start coming back? Are you heavily on the social side with weddings? How, how's your business looking? Um, my business is not majority of weddings. I mean, we certainly do our, our fair share, but I mean, we do, we do a lot of high end social. We do, um, and, and we do do corporate. I think that, you know, right now the Hamptons are packed because everybody from Manhattan is in their homes. And I, I'm pretty sure what people are going to start doing is like, um, dinner parties and, you know, smaller groups at their homes. Um, so I'm um, starting to prepare, you know, again, these party in the box kind of drop off things every, you know, um, barbecues, um, California style, American style, smokehouse style. And then they, they're able to add on to the supermarket if they wanted to add on other things. So I'm going to be adding on, you know, paper goods and bamboo plates and, you know, things like that. And then the people who want staff there were, were getting monogrammed masks um, and gloves. And, um, you know, we're going to make it as, you know, as safe as possible. So and the napkins will match the tablecloth. And the, and the um, mask will match the tablecloth. Yeah. I'm going to call you, Andrea. I need an order for my daughter's wedding. So I'm going to call you after okay. this. <laughs> Anyway, um, let's open up some questions from the audience. I know Meredith is there and I think a lot of questions have come in. So before we go back to um, our discussion, let's let's see what the audience uh, are asking out there. Meredith. Sure. Yeah. First, I wanted to say that we had a few people write in thanking for the honesty and for sharing from some of you who haven't pivoted your businesses. They really appreciate hearing that and hearing that it's okay to be on pause, to not pivot, to not change. Um, so they thanked us for that. Great. And for a question that we haven't heard yet, um, how are you keeping your staff safe and healthy going forward, looking towards when events start up again? Anybody? Since it's not um, You know, transparency is probably the most important, important aspect with our team and they're scared too. They don't know what's happening. I mean, they, they're very concerned of what's, you know, they hear, they hear everything on the news. They, they may think they're out of jobs. So communication is really, really important and having zoom meetings and, and each department doing it, you can have a group meeting, but each department needs to have this reassurance that, the bit, what is, what's going on with the business? What's going on with the world? I mean, they're dealing with their kids at home. They're dealing with, you know, salespeople are dealing with clients that are just, it's hard. It is very, very difficult. So I think that, that maintaining relationships, whether they are furloughed or laid off you know, or still working, I think that the communication as leaders needs to be really, really strong with our team. I think that the most recent data that we have showed that in 2018, there were close to 200,000 people employed in the catering industry in the United States. So that's a, you know, a decent small size city. And Merrill's right. I mean, some of them are wondering whether they're going to be able to go back to work or not. Uh, I think that in terms of what we can do to keep them safe, it's the same thing that we're going to ask the, uh, the guests to do, which is, so, you know, be willing to have their temperatures taken and, track very exactly who is where uh, and ask people to be extraordinarily honest on an ongoing basis about whether they might have come in contact with someone. I think that eventually what they're talking about, there's an article in the New York Times yesterday saying that they think that possibly as many as 20% of the people that live in New York 
may have come into contact with uh, or maybe carriers at this point. Um, once it gets to the point where there's this herd immunity, which is getting up to 70 or 80 percent of the population, then this will cease to be a problem. But it's between now and then, we really need to be concerned about the safety of our employees as well as the guests. Okay. Any, anybody else want to add something? Or, or, well, sorry, go on. My, my question is um, to those of you on the panel, I guess what we're going to do when we start gearing up is we're going to need to um, be super honest with staff and some of them are going to choose not to come back to work because they're going to be afraid. And um, I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation to have. And do we start with the most senior and work down? And I guess it depends on, I mean, people are so different. Like I have no fear. It's, I, it's very strange, but it's, it's both the positive and the negative about me, but I, I'm not all that concerned, but there are people who are like really scared and rightfully yeah. so. So I, it's going to be interesting how we're going to deal with who we're bringing back because their attitude is going to also be super important, right? You don't want somebody tiptoeing on the yeah. floor who, you know, goes back because they see an older person or it, it's all going to be super, very interesting. A learning I think experience. That, that a lot of people will find new careers too. I think this is an opportunity for some of our staff to say, you know what, I've done this. What else am I going to do? And I think that we are going to lose some people um, organically, I think. Uh, and um, I think you're right. I think you're spot on. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. More. You it. You yeah, answer. no, I, I would agree. I think I think we have the same thing. You know, we have about 30 people in and out of here um, most days, and we're all wearing masks. And uh, there are some you can tell that would rather we speak to them six feet apart and there are other ones but that's how much but we we made a pact with them that we would really be ultra careful be staying at home and i think once people come back too we're going to lose some of that security because you can't control 100 120 right. people and I, I i agree with reed we're, we're gonna have to be very understanding i'm not afraid either and i'm learning about covid um, there seems to be the less about, but um, people that don't want to work, they shouldn't be shamed, no judgment. We, we just need the truth because I don't want someone showing up to work because they're afraid of not being able to come back at some later date and time. Um, right. it, you know, it, it, it's, it's understandable that they would be afraid. And for those that are willing to work, um, you know, we're also going to be honest, hey, this is at your own risk because nothing is guaranteed. There, there is a chance that you could get COVID working in the food service industry moving forward. So I think we just have to be above board, open, honest, and let people who want to work, work. And then there's the, the question, well, if they get COVID during one of our events, is that workers' comp? Carl? I have heard that there are a couple of states that have mandated COVID coverage as part of workers' comp, but it seems to me that that's something that's probably not supportable in the long term, yeah. because yeah. how could you prove that they got yeah. it from a right. shift at work as opposed to going to the grocery store or walking down the street? Yeah. So, I, you know, again, it, I think that is one of those things that's likely to be worked out and will probably evolve over the course of this crisis. Okay, thank you. Okay, Meredith, you want to uh, throw us another one? Sure. We have about 20 questions about buffets. So let's tackle the topic of the buffet. What are we going to do about it? <laughs> there isn't any buffet. No more. No. No food stations. No, none of that right now. You're going to see more seated dinners. Um, I mean, I don't see any way around the buffet. Do you guys, Norm? Does, every, does everybody I, I, I agree? I'm, just interested. I'm not, I'm not sure agree? about much. 
I'm not really sure about much moving forward, but I'm sure about that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so what about, what about <laughs> sneezing? <laughs> if, if, if well, you improvise I sneezing, heard, you might be able to make it work. I was, on, I was on a call with a group of other caterers from the New York area, and what they were saying is the exact opposite, was the, the fact that you can control the six feet apart social distancing more so in a buffet situation or stations as opposed to um, a seated dinner. And they were all concerned about, from a legal standpoint, if it, it have to fit, sit six feet away, how many people can you fit on a table? And that in, in, in yes, you may need sneeze guards or only staff can serve the food, but they thought it was the opposite. By the way, I, I'd also heard the, the opposite, Andrea, but I didn't dare say it. I'm glad you brought it up because I'm not going to run. But I'd also heard the opposite that um, the buffet is going to be much easier. They, they are going to have a much e You're going to have a lot more buffet tables, um, but people can, can control, uh, you know, where you stand in line. I don't know about all the touching the food and what everything, but maybe they're going to have disposables. Uh, I heard that people are going to use disposables, high end quality disposables so that people can see that things are being, you know, maybe the biodegradable things are going to come in. I had a lot of different things over the last uh, few few weeks, but I guess that's where people are going to be creative, right? Yeah, and I think that, that, that seated dinners are may not happen. What I'm saying is like meals in a box, like already prepared ah. meals that, and, and that could be by out of the buffet line that they're taking it, but, um, yeah, I don't. I think that we're going to see more cocktail parties rather than seated dinners because they can't sit um, next to each other. I mean, it's a sixty-inch round. Um, but yeah, I do Derek. see more um, really nice high-end meals in a box. There's an article in today's LA Times about from some epidemiologist being interviewed by one of the food writers from the Times about whether. Um, COVID is really transferable via food. And this person that was interviewed was basically pretty reassuring that it was not, that yeah, it is transferable. So I think it's definitely something that once it's proved that it doesn't really lend itself to being transferred via food, some of these changes may not be quite as uh, significant as they seem to us right the second. But I, I would agree that you know, there are buffets and there are buffets. When I first started out in the catering industry out in the middle of the country, all buffets were self-service. When I was managing a large catering company in New York, basically all buffets are served by somebody standing there ladling food onto the plate. And it may be that that's something that's gonna end up being more common out in the rest of the country rather than the self-serve buffet. I can let you know that on the corporate delivery side right now, we used to drop off 200 pounds full of food. Um, the largest thing that we're doing now is uh, for a family of four, um, but that's for people that are hunkered down together. Um, everything we are doing is individual boxes, mm -hmm. everything. So we, we, have, we have some people, as much as 80 people, um, ordering food all individually wrapped. They, they don't wanna see anything in a pan, they don't want to share anything from a pan, and that's that's on the corporate side right now. And and Carl brings it up because go ahead. So so, so Norm, when you're um, looking to do a wedding uh, in July or something, are you are you thinking? Are you doing a menu? Are you talking to the bride about everything being served in a box? How how are you talking to the brides? And actually, nope. Reed, I'd love I think, to hear what I, I, you're I doing. think it will be service staff with masks and gloves. But we're going to let the bride choose. You know, I, there are some people right. that are not afraid. Mm -hmm. And I think there'll be some more people out there that would rather postpone. And I, I think we're going to see all, all, all gamuts. We're going to have all different kinds of brides. And what we have to do is step up to the plate and serve each one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the thing that's complicated about that is that what works for the bride in her little mind may not be what works for all of her guests. And so are we going to have all of these people freaking out um, about 
why is this food being served this way and there should be a, a you know a safer way to do this i'm well yeah. okay i've got the room to put three people at 72 inch rounds and it is right spot on six in, six foot social distancing if we do plated which 98% of our clients want plated service anyway but i anticipate doing a lot of um really nice stations and having and it's actually the way that we execute stations now and everything is plated onto small plates and we'll be using all bamboo and all uh disposable and uh, the staff will actually yeah. plate the three items that are on the small plate which is you know the equivalent of a very heavy appetizer slash mini entree and people will come up and we will have it lined on tables and people will come and get their own and then move away from the table. And I think that that's going to be um, very manageable for us to do. My son's getting married in October and that's the way we're going to roll. So. Cool. Okay. I'm going to come to you for advice. That's good. I got a lot of advice going here. So um, Meredith, have you got a few more questions for us? Yes, we have a question here. Thoughts on food service and guest interaction for a June bride who does not want to move her wedding. So I guess we're looking at those first weddings that are going to happen. What is your advice? Well, that's the, that's the social distancing. That's what Reed was saying. I mean, at the end of the day, Reed said that you know her wedding in october that's what they're planning to do that's going to be probably with social distancing there's i don't you know maybe we'll have a vaccine by october but probably not um do they want more ideas <laughs> let's try yeah. another one i think yeah. Reed gave a good answer for that yeah do you anticipate the cost of weddings increasing based upon additional labor and requirements to implement some of these precautions? Oh, that's a good one, guys. I do. We haven't done the numbers yet, but I can't anticipate it not. I mean, doing it, if we're doing boxes for everything, and um, but then we have to do the numbers, actually, because I can't, I can't, uh, pan. Carl, do you have a, an answer for that? Uh, well, I think that labor is one concern, and I think there's also going to be some challenges related to food costs. I mean, we're hearing about these supply chain issues where some food items are not going to be as available because of limited labor availability in packing plants and in the farm fields and things like that. So, you know, that may be something because these commodity items, the price will eventually go back down. But probably for the immediate future, and you're probably seeing this in the grocery store also, some of these prices are going up. I mean, the price of eggs is much higher than it was before this started. Prices of some types of meat, prices of, of you know, pork has gone way up here in the East. Um, so it's not just the labor. There is at least on a transitory basis, there's going to be food cost issues as well. Well, there's Reed, also are you planning to put your prices? are you by the way are you going to give a different price if a bride gets married on a on a monday tuesday wednesday i have we, nobody discussed that but i'm assuming have you have you got any brides that are interested in taking a day of the week oh Reed? we have people who of people that are postponing i mean we always do i don't know 15 maybe thursday weddings at each venue per year but um in 2021, we're going to have a fair number of midweek. And what we have said to all of those people who are moving from their date in 2020, and even if they go to later this year, we're going to honor the lower price, um, lower minimums, and encouraging them to fill up those dates because we don't want to lose anybody. I mean, so far, we've been super lucky and have only written one refund check um out of probably 60 to 65 that we've moved um that's i mean i think that's incredible and speaks to my sales people's uh persuasion <laughs> but uh yeah we're doing midweek and and it's great with regard to the i think there are going to be some additional costs that we're going to have to pass on we get um 
fifty percent of our uh, our second payment for the wedding is considered um, and is approximately fifty percent of what the total invoice is going to be. I think with guest counts going down because of the no travel and because of pe uh, people being fearful, we're going to use what monies we've retained to be able to execute the event for a lower guest count and be able to throw in some of these services that are going to cost all of us money. There's no doubt about it. Sanitation machines and PPP for everybody, all disposable. So yeah, it, it we'll have to figure out how we're going to do that, but it will be a cost. Not only do we have to figure out how to do it, we have to figure out how to explain it to a client because already in their mind is, all right, well, my guest count's going lower, so I'll be paying less. <laughs> That is something that we really do have to get that message across. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Okay, let's uh, have one more question and then we'll do a little bit final rounds with everyone. So let's let's uh, bring one more question to the table. And anybody that we didn't get to answer your questions, we're going to send out all the questions to the panels and some of them will be more than happy to answer your questions at a later stage. So um, Meredith, give us one, one final question. So I'm picking one that I've seen a lot in the comments, even though it's on the entertainment side, I want to ask it because everyone is asking your opinion on dancing. Do you think that it's going to happen or maybe not right off the bat at events or what, what are you thinking? Dancing at their table, <laughs> dancing in their seat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if, we if I, I think you're going to see it all. Coming, I think coming. every wedding is going to be different. Yeah. I, I think you're going to do 20 weddings in a month, and all 20 are going to be different. Some people are going to be fine with it, and other people are fucking going to dance in their chair. I think the DJ may say, "Okay, 20 people on the dance floor, and then 20 people go home." I don't know. I, it's it's um it's going to be it, the, you know who's got to really come up with these different fun ideas are the, the musicians and the, the DJs and yeah. the bands because it can happen. I mean, look at mitzvahs. I see that kind of stuff happening where a group of people go up on the dance floor. Everybody watches. Uh -huh. Well, dance floors may just have to be larger uh, in terms of the ratio between the size of the dance floor and the number of guests. So. Yeah. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't a father and a daughter and a, a son and the mother social cohorts? We can continue to have those dances. Because I saw somebody write a scathing review of, of a venue, I think, in British Columbia, and she was all upset because they told her that she couldn't have her father-daughter dance. They're social cohorts. I mean... Yeah. 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 So. That's probably sharing a home, think, isn't it? So. Yeah, I think so. I think, and I think it's like what everybody said during the process that a lot of these decisions are going to be, and Norm says it all the time, these are going to be individual decisions. You're going to know whether you personally want to keep that little bit of distance or if you're fine to go on the dance floor. And the people that are on the dance floor are going to have to know that, you know, everybody's making those decisions. So, you know, it probably will be all the young people and the older crowd will stay a little bit further back, you know. It depends. Or if you're Reed and you're not scared, Reed's going to be right out there in the dance floor dancing away. Right, Reed? <laughs> Absolutely. Rapping with Absolutely. everybody. Okay, so we're going to, you guys have been great and we've had a really great amount of questions. So how I like to wrap it up is just, to go around um, and just ask everybody to say uh, something that can give some hope um, and energy to our audience that you know are listening to us and have taken their time. Um, and if you just you know would give them something, it doesn't have to be related to your business, just something that maybe you've heard that's keeping you going, that's keeping you energized um, to share with the audience. So, Andrea, maybe you want to start because uh you kind of said a great one at the beginning i just i don't stop right something you said like that at the beginning i just keep going well you know what i guess one of my favorite quotes that i've always lived by is the only way out is through and 
that's really it. it it's going to pass eventually. And uh, there's nothing that we could do about it. We didn't do anything wrong. Um, and we just have to wait it out. I love that. That's a great one. Norm, Norm, you want to you wanna say something? You know what? I, I think that's very apropos. You know, I think of Winston Churchill saying, never give up, never give up, never give up. And, you know, we didn't stay open because of $120,000 a month we're making. It was for morale. It was for the people who, it was maybe for uh, a quicker uh, resurgence back into our market. But I, I just really see and feel that people want to get back to their lives. And I think there will be a lot of celebration once they're allowed to do that. So I'm optimistically hopeful and looking forward to lots of weddings in the future. Meryl. You want to say something? You know, it's it's natural to feel scared and overwhelmed by the situation, but let's not forget that there cannot be darkness without light, right? So we're going to get this light. And, you know, together as an industry, we're stronger and we're growing closer every day. And this pandemic creates like limitations for all of us. This industry works on limitations every day. So we can deal with this. I and mean, we have we change on a, on a dime all the time. So we'll get through it. We will. One other thing I wanted to say before um, the other two is these questions that are still have to be asked or answered. We will be able to. We have an L, uh, LCA Facebook page, is Leading Caters of America, that we'll be able to put these answers on. Is that right, Carl? Our Facebook <clears throat> page. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. That would be very uh, helpful. So everybody can go. You'll have access to a lot of these companies that can answer your questions. Uh, that'd be very helpful. So Reed, why don't you just um, give us uh, your your uh, final uh, say, and then we'll we'll end it with Carl. Um, what's so challenging is that we are we are the flipping party people of the world. And we are used to being optimistic and happy, and it is what we do professionally and socially. We bring people together. So I, I understand the, the, the depression that people are suffering. You know, I think communication is the most important thing with our staff and with our clients, and we are being extremely proactive. Um, People deserve to know what we're doing. They need to. They they deserve to know that we are a solvent company. That we have not spent their deposits. That we uh, plan to be in business when all of this becomes safe once again. And uh, I'm just trying to keep my positive voice, which is not always easy. But I'm working hard at it. And you guys all encourage me to do that. Nice. Carl, why don't you give some final words from, you know, you personally and maybe from the LCA, something that you maybe keep hearing all the time from your, your um, peers? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, this too shall pass eventually. Um, I was speaking to a caterer yesterday who is in his 80s and he started out the catering business in the 1960s. And he said that he's never seen anything like this, but he is confident that we will get through this and that the business will return. I think that there are definitely opportunities here for small caterers who are not part of the sort of large catering um, uh, pool uh, around the country, uh, because I do think that people are going to want to get back to entertaining. And I think that there are, you know, uh, doing various types of entertainment, whether it's corporate or social, is so much part of in, our, our culture and it's so ingrained that I'm confident that it is gonna come back and the caterers as well as the other service providers for the event industry will benefit from this. Fabulous, fabulous. So guys, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate uh, you being with us uh, today. And I know that you're asked to be on many uh, platforms and you know support a lot of people. So I do appreciate you giving us your time. 
And thank you to our fabulous audience that um, always keeps coming back to hear our fabulous uh, industry leaders here that have got uh, some good insights and and we appreciate all the transparency both ways, you know, the, the open questions that you ask and the openness and the frankness that the panel has been able to give today. And I'm sure it will continue. Like Meryl said, Meryl, what was the, it's just LCA on Facebook. They just put in LCA it's or leaders of America. It's a Facebook page. Just follow it. And then we, periodically we were putting these answers up to your question. So I highly suggest that you, uh, everybody tries to uh, join that and, uh, and be part of that. All right, everyone. We wish everyone a great week week and a good day and um and stay safe and stay well and you know smile right thank you guys thank you for Thanks keeping so our community together sandy with all these different webinars that you guys are doing it's been great um i think that you are a nice calming force in this crazy mm -hmm. so thank you we try we really try we have a, we have a great community and we just want to share what we can do with everyone because that's what it's about, right? We're sharing yes. industry. We're an amazing sharing industry. That's right. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Meryl. Our next Leading Caters of America panel will be on March 5th with a different panel. Yeah, with a different group. What and be? a different spin. And a right. different, different spin. Right. Yeah. OK. Great. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.